and guess what that would be? What it would be for? Well, it would be for reading, right? So you'd see activity in a part of the brain to do with reading, and if you didn't know that that part of the brain was involved in reading, you might infer, ah, this part is to do with inhibiting an automatic behaviour, whereas in fact it isn't, it's to do with reading. So that shows you how these association studies, even though you've got the behaviour, you've got the part of the brain lighting up because of blood oxygenation levels, you can interpret the data wrong. Now you'd never do that for the Stroop test because it's obvious and we know what those reading areas are, but for the more subtle aspects of self-control, whenever you see one of these studies and it says, oh, this area causes blah, 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 in a media article, just take that with a pinch of salt because you've got to think carefully, oh, hang on, is it critical to that behaviour or is it just involved in it? Okay, so in contrast, oh, actually I'm just talking about imaging again, so this guy Logothetis talks about what we can and can't do with fMRI, which is basically what I've just said, so I don't want to say that again. There was another paper which is called Voodoo Correlations in Social Neuroscience, which is, if I get you to do a personality questionnaire about extroversion, you might answer it slightly differently on one day to another day, and this is a problem in psychology anyway, because like, your mood could be different, and it might have, say, 88% reliability, so you know, there's a small bit of variance in how extrovert you are. Uh, if I then scanned a part of your brain and correlated that data, I'd have to multiply it by the reliability of the questionnaire. And some people in neuroscience seem to be reporting correlations which are higher than you could expect statistically due to the unreliability of psychological tests. I should say they are quite reliable, but they're not 100% reliable, if that makes sense. The next study is, I think, one my friend James told me about, actually. A person went to a market, got a dead haddock, put the dead haddock in the fMRI machine and found some correlations because, as they say, across the 130,000 voxels, which are 3D pixels, the chance of getting a false positive is pretty much certain. Okay? And then the final one is this one, which I absolutely love. This is a pure psychology experiment, nothing neuro here. If you show people a picture of a brain and then give them an incorrect psychological explanation about something, they are more likely to believe it. Okay? And I think that's a brilliant finding. This is the sort of thing psychologists think about with our studies. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is show you lots of pictures of the brain and then tell you about it. Okay? So, okay, so in contrast to the imaging studies that those guys do, us neuropsychologists look for dissociations. So if you've got damage to an area here, that might cause a certain behavioural deficit. If you've got damage to a different area, that might cause a different behavioural deficit. And if we're very good, we can find what they call a double dissociation, which is distinct and opposite behavioural deficits. So a person with damage to area A might have deficit X but not Y, and a person with damage to area B might have deficit Y but not X. That sounds really abstract, so what I'll do is I'll show you an example, which is to do with aphasia. Uh, now, I spoke earlier about the area which is responsible for speech, which is here, which is Broca's area. And I think probably the best way to do it is just to show you a video of a girl that's had a stroke and then I can show you what I mean. So it's in here I think and it is Broca's aphasia. Okay, so this girl's had a stroke. What's aphasia? Aphasia is a problem with uh, speech and language. Let me see if I've got some volume here. Okay. So what's your name? Um, Sarah. Scott. Oh. goes on for a while. Basically that girl there has no problems with the understanding of language. She understands exactly what the other lady was saying to her and she sort of knows conceptually what she wants to communicate but what she can't seem to find is the words that she wants to say. 
And yet when she does find those words, she's got no problem in actually saying them physically in terms of motor control. So that's one sort of aphasia that you get from damage to uh, Broca's area, which is this area here. Now in contrast, there's another sort of aphasia, which is damage to Wernicke's area, which you were pointing out here. And I'll show you this. This is a very different sort of speech and language problem. Okay, so in total contrast to the girl with Broca's aphasia, that woman has no problems with fluency and saying words. However, the words that she is saying are completely irrelevant to the topic, and in fact, some of them were actually nonsense words. Because she's so fluent, though, you sort of think, oh, I, I'm starting to follow what, oh, no, hang on, I don't know what on earth she's saying. And it's a very different sort of aphasia, and that's because it's damaged actually to Wernicke's area here, which is actually responsible for conceptually sort of what language is and finding the correct words to match your concepts. So that's an example of a double dissociation. And the reason I've shown you that is to show you that basically neuropsychology is a much more powerful method than these imaging technologies. It's not to rubbish them. These are brilliant, these imaging technologies. But we actually learn much more and can infer much more about brain function from neuropsychology. So if I do from current slides, we on to the next one. Okay, so it's relatively straightforward in speech and language because we've got a science of language called linguistics and you can directly observe by listening to it what's gone wrong. When you're trying to work out cognition, though, it's a lot more tricky. Yeah? Just interest, do, you, do you think that woman with Bernicke's damage was understanding what was being asked of her, which is unable to express it? Um, it's difficult to say. Apparently people that have had a mild Bernicke's aphasia and have later recovered from it have reported that, yeah, you were all talking rubbish. Why were you all talking rubbish like that? So they have a receptive aphasia where they can't understand language either. There was one chap that one of my supervisors worked with who was in a hospital because he had brain injury and he was convinced he'd been captured by the French and he kept saying, I'm going to get you bastards and you get out of here imprisoning me and they're going, you're in a hospital, okay? You couldn't understand what they were saying. So it's very difficult. Okay, so... <clears throat> The point with the double dissociation is, though, it's trickier to use that for more cognitive stuff because you have to ask people what's going on and if they've got damage to that cognitive stuff, they can't always report it. So it's easier with language, which is why I showed you that as an example. Okay. Um, and although you can tell from double dissociation that an area is critical to that function, it doesn't mean that it's the only thing that area does. It could do other things as well. And it doesn't mean it's the only area that's critical to that function. There could be other areas that are critical to that as well. Okay, so now we get on to the main part of the talk, which is the neuropsychology of self-control, which is about what my research is about. So to give you a definition of self-control, and this is my definition, so you're welcome to criticise it. Um, I think that self-control is the ability to control one's attention or emotions in order to control one's physical movement for the purposes of achieving a goal which may not be immediately rewarding, okay? So just to break that down a little bit, somebody that can focus their attention has more self-control than somebody that can't. Uh, somebody that can control their emotions has more self-control than somebody that can't. Um, somebody that can control their movement has more self-control than somebody that can't, but I'm not actually going to talk about movement here. It is frontal lobe, so it is control, but it's not prefrontal cortex, which is the more cognitive aspect that I'm looking at. Uh, and also somebody that can control themselves for long-term reward or to avoid future punishment, I should perhaps put in the definition, has more self-control than somebody that can only act on immediate rewards. Have you got a question? Yeah. Um, does the capability of multitasking imply more or less self-control? More or less self-control. Um, in terms of defining it for achieving a goal, it could be good in some situations and not so good in others. So sometimes it might be really good to focus your mind on one thing. So say, playing a game of chess, probably good to concentrate on that and not think about other things. 
uh, successfully bringing up children so that they don't die if you're concentrating on cooking. No, not now. I'm cooking, <laughs> and your child dies because you're not paying attention to them. Sometimes you probably need to multitask, yeah? Can I comment that self, um, sorry, multitasking yeah. is really the myth of jumping between tasks because nobody can really run two tasks successfully at the same time. Yeah, that's, that's kind of right. Basically, anyone is better at doing one task at a time than trying to do several. So sometimes multitasking is a useful talent because you need to be able to notice other things that are going on in your environment. Um, but actually trying to do too many things at the same time isn't generally optimal, for human beings at least. Okay, so this chap was Phineas Gage, some of you may have heard about, probably one of the most widely cited brain injury patients ever. Uh, he worked on the railroads in America, and one of the things he had to do was to blast boulders out of the way. And what they do is they hand drill into the boulder, and then they put some sort of explosive, I don't know whether it would be gunpowder, probably gunpowder, it would be pre-dynamite I think, and then they put some cotton wool in, and then they tamp it down with a big bar, light fuse, run away, boom. Unfortunately, he forgot to put the cotton wool in, and so when he was tamping down the gunpowder, he got a spark from this iron bar you see him carrying, and the iron bar hit him just below his left cheekbone, went through the front of his brain, and right out the top of his head, and landed some distance away. Now, the amazing thing is that this guy actually survived this, um, and some doctors got a hold of him, and studied the changes in his behaviour. And this is probably one of the first examples of somebody surviving a severe frontal lobe injury, so you could see what it did to his behaviour. So the doctor said that the equilibrium or balance, so to speak, between his intellectual faculties and his animal propensities seems to have been destroyed. So that sort of more human side of his nature that was controlling his animal desires, just gone. So he's fitful, irreverent, indulging times and graces, profanity. I'm going to put this into 20th century speak. Basically, he didn't seem to care very much about other people and would swear. Could be aggressive, but there's nothing actually saying that he was violent. Um, he could plan towards the future, but he would abandon these plans in the face of any sort of difficulty. So anything that was like challenging him, he would just go for something more feasible, something that was easier in the moment. So he wasn't good at thinking about long-term rewards. Uh, he could also be like very stubborn, but also like flit in terms of his attention. So. They also say that he's a child and his intellectual capacity, so obviously affected his intelligence in some way. Uh, but he's got the animal passions of a strong man, okay? So this could be that he's dangerous. Uh, he used to be very persistent and energetic and enthusiastic, but now he isn't. And basically his friend said he was no longer Gage. He's not the same person they once knew. And here's a reconstruction. His skull's in a medical museum in uh, the United States somewhere. And Hannah Damasio and colleagues did a reconstruction using a computer graphics to see which part of his brain this, the uh, bar presumably went through. And I think it was the medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, so clearly, people like Finis Gage and the modern day counterparts show us that the frontal lobes are critical for self-control. But what sort of cognition is going on in those frontal lobes? So we, we've got the brain injury, we've got the behavior. What's actually going on inside these people's heads? That's what we're sort of interested in, because that can explain OK, so what we've got here is a table of disexecutive symptoms, the disexecutive syndrome being a psychological term for problems that people can have after frontal lobe brain damage. But people can have these problems anyway, and pretty much everyone in the room will have one or two of these problems a little bit. Okay? So what we've got here is a whole bunch of different things, problems with planning, distractibility, lack of insight and understanding the nature of the problems you've got, uh, restlessness, apathy, aggression, uh, being impulsive, having problems inhibiting yourself, uh, all sorts of different problems. And when they're reported by the carers, these are the people that live with the brain injured person, they report them as being much more frequent than the brain injured person themselves report. And this, in fact, could be due to the lack of insight, because one of the things that can be damaged is metacognition, which is our ability to think about thinking. So if I said, you know, do you ever lose your temper to a person with this sort of brain injury? They might lose their temper quite a bit. But they might say, oh no, I don't lose my temper. Which shows a failure to actually understand their own thinking and to monitor their own behaviour, if that makes sense. And in contrast, if I gave any of you guys this questionnaire um, and got you to fill it out, you'd probably report slightly more problems than the people in your personal life because you would notice when you lost your temper or failed to concentrate on something more than people around you. It seems to be the opposite with brain injured people. OK, 
Okay, so I'm gonna have to speed up a little bit because it's gone a bit longer than I thought. Okay, so 